I'm Barry Bird, Professor of Computer Science and Mathematics at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. I'm here at QCon New York City speaking with Roy Rappaport. He's Manager of Insight Engineering at Netflix. Roy, tell us what Insight Engineering is. Well, at Netflix, Insight Engineering is the group uh, responsible for developing Netflix's real-time operational insight systems. So we develop platforms to help Netflix basically knows, know uh, what goes bump in the night and what we should do about it. Okay, give, give, uh, be a little bit more specific. <laughs> when you say insight, uh, so, uh, traditionally, how, how does that differentiate itself from other aspects of the Netflix operation? So think, let's use an, a different word um, and talk about monitoring. Um, traditionally, every company has some sort of monitoring solution. And if you think about monitoring, monitoring is really about, you know, how is this server doing, how is that system doing, etc. We tend to think of this a little more holistically, and we tend to think of monitoring as just the first step in figuring out, actually, what we need to do to manage our operations. So mo if you think about monitoring as observability, as the ability to know in relatively fine detail how any, any given server in our environment is doing, how any given application is doing, the job of Insight Engineering is to actually build the platforms that both give us that observability, so monitoring platforms, telemetry platforms, and then also actually build on that the ability to actually create insight. In other words, decisions, uh, recommendations, and you know, self-healing systems, that kind of stuff. So data is necessary, but it's not sufficient to actually manage today's you know, production environments. And just to give us an idea of the scope of this operation, how many people do you how many how many people do you manage? How many people are required uh, to do this? What sounds to me like a monumental task. Well, so um, our job, which is just to build the systems for everybody else to use, um, my group is about ten people plus me, though they do the heavy lifting. And before this interview, we spoke about canary analysis. That's one of your main thrusts. I yeah. want to find out all about canary analysis. Go. Great. So canary analysis. Um, this is what I actually came to QCon to talk about. Generally, canary analysis is a deployment pattern. In other words, you've got, you know, let's say a server working in production. And you've got, let's say, version 1.0 of that server. And you want to roll out a new version of the server into production to um, provide uh, the same service you were providing before, but with some enhancements, of course, to, hypothetically speaking, 48 million streaming customers. You could just deploy the new version of the server into production and hope for the best. Um, or you could do what we call canary analysis, which is, let's say you've got 1,000 servers running 1.0. Let's deploy one server running 1.01 and shunt a proportional amount of traffic to that server. So now you've got 1.01 .01 with about a thousandth of the traffic that the 1.0 cluster is doing. And then you compare this canary to the baseline cluster and see, is it doing reasonably well? Is it doing worse, better? And then uh, if it's doing well, well, maybe let's invest, let's increase our investment, increase our commitment to 1.01 .01 by increasing the number of servers running 101 to, let's say, 100. So now 10% approximately of your traffic is, go is going to the 101 cluster. And then you again compare the canary cluster from, uh, to the baseline cluster. And if it looks OK, then maybe you go finally to 1,000 of the new server and 1,000 of the old server. At that point, actually, 50% of your traffic is being handled by the new systems. And if it's still looking OK, then you can shut down the old systems and you've moved forward to the new uh, system environment. So it's not a test pattern. It's more of a deployment pattern. It's a way to uh, deploy changes in production in a way that is a little more holistic, we think, a little safer, and gives you a greater degree of certainty and minimizes the risk to your customers. Now, there's a certain difference between real canaries in mines and pieces of software and servers that you deploy in real life. One of them that occurs to me is the incompatibilities between version 1.01 .01 and version 1. So by putting out one unit with version 1.01, um, don't you have to worry not so much about how version 1.01 .01 is going to operate, but how it'll operate with along with version 1? Um, can this be a problem in doing canary analysis? Yeah, it can. Um, for us, what we found was that, generally speaking, because of our service-oriented architecture approach, where we don't have monolithic servers, we have hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of services, 
uh, interrelated, we don't tend to see changes in a server actually come along with a required change in interface. Because if you change the interface of the server, then you also need to make sure that everybody else knows about that change in interface. So we tend to think of software deployments as actually decoupled from interface changes. So let's say, for example, that you have a new API that you want to support. Generally speaking, you wouldn't want to immediately deprecate the old API anyway. You know, whether you deploy one of 1.01 or a thousand of 1.01, um, anybody who's talking to that server will need to migrate to using the new API. So irrespective of canary analysis, what you would probably say is that, let's say that my API endpoint today is slash API slash V1. The new server might support also a slash API slash V2, but should support slash API slash V1 anyway. And so those two servers should actually be able to both work at the same time, um, irrespective of whether you use canary analysis. OK. Now, you described a procedure where you introduce one unit, one server, and I imagine when you do that, you, you learn all kinds of things. Um, and then you say you gradually up the ante to maybe 100 servers or half of the servers that you have. Um, what kinds of things are you likely to learn as you up the ante that you didn't learn when you introduced the first server? Well, one of the problems with just having one server, uh, and I talk about this in my talk, is uh, at least in the public cloud environment, uh, we work in Amazon, you get a certain degree of inconsistency between servers. Servers can be outliers. You, um, you're running virtual machines on hosts. Maybe you have one server that's running on a host that is completely not busy and has fantastic performance. Or maybe that server is running on a host that's incredibly busy, and, and therefore that server has terrible performance. Um, deploying one server is actually less good than deploying multiple servers, because then you have that outlier effect. It's good to figure out whether or not you've got you know, significant problems. One server may be able to tell you whether or not you've got you know, significantly high error rates, for example, and you should pull back right then. But generally speaking, we find that we have the best fidelity, the best ability to compare baseline to canaries when you have a group of canaries that you can actually look at the aggregate signal from, because then you weaken the um, effect of any given outlier um, within that group. OK. So now, give us some of the details. Uh, I've got the general idea, um, deploy slowly. That's a, a two-word summary. Yeah. Uh, but there must be more gotchas involved in doing this, because Otherwise, it wouldn't be given a formal name such as canary analysis. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I came here to this talk, and whenever we do a talk about how we do things at Netflix, it's very easy for these things to become very aspirational. Um, I have two analytics engineers with masters in artificial intelligence working for me, and a PhD from you know who, who's worked on this, and a whole bunch of platform people. We've invested a whole bunch of money in this, and we have really fantastic canary analysis story, but. I would actually argue that the thing that I want people to get is that canary analysis really is actually just deploy slowly. It's a little more than that. I would probably argue that at minimum, canary analysis is deploy slowly. Throughout the process of deploying slowly, look at your canaries, have the metrics to understand whether or not your canaries are behaving well, and be, be able to segregate your metrics between canaries and baseline. That's it. I think most people probably have that ability. Most people um, probably could use that ability to uh, great effect. And if you just do that, and you haven't until now, well, frankly, my job is done. Mm -hmm. So everything from that is a process of continuous improvement, right? So if you've got that, where do you go from there? Well, one thing is, how do you figure out what metrics matter to you? Um, for us, what we found was that we have, we have a system where any developer can instrument their application to send any number of metrics they want. It's entirely up to them. Um, and that means that we have some metrics that are actually really useful for figuring out whether your canary is doing better than your, ba than your baseline. And we have some canaries that are, that we have some metrics that are frankly less useful. Um, metrics that are more business oriented than application or system oriented um, tend to be less relevant to figuring out whether your canary is working at least as well as your baseline. But so metrics like, for example, you know, CPU on the machine requests handled in the machine, um, errors on the machine, those are, those are a better indicator of canary success than, um, you know, let's say, the amount of dollars that we collected in sales from a given machine in a, in a given period. And why would that be the case? 
Because if you think about the traffic that the canary gets, you really want to look at the characteristics of what the machine does. You, look at, you want to look at the characteristics of the work and the quality of that work. And so w there are metrics that are more useful for defining the quality of the work that the machine does than, for example, dollars, which are less relevant to version 1.01 of the server, for example, versus, versus uh, version 1.0 of the server. So if you think about a server as essentially managing requests, taking a request, processing it, returning something useful, you really want to look at the rate at which you're doing the work, the speed at which you're doing the work, so you know ba uh, bandwidth versus uh, throughput versus latency, and the quality at which you're doing the rate, where um, you look at, for example, error rates. They tend to be more relevant to the immediate tactical decision of whether to move forward in the deployment than um, other things that are more sort of like longer term and more business uh, intelligence type of metrics. Are there surprises in this kind of analysis? Are there things that you didn't expect when you first envisioned doing a canary analysis type deployment? Well, all the time. I mean, you know, look, no developer um, deploys something into production expecting it to break, um, generally speaking. And you have to remember that, especially because canary analysis is not a test pattern, it's not a replacement to any sort of testing. Generally speaking, by the time we're deploying into production, it's already passed all of our testing. It's passed all the unit testing, it's passed all the integration testing, it's passed all the user acceptance testing and A-B testing, et cetera. So generally speaking, every time we deploy with canary analysis, we expect the canary to pass and to be deployed. Um, I've got stats in my talk about you know, the frequency with which, frankly, our canaries don't pass. And every one of those you can consider to be a, a, a surprise. And you would consider, frankly, that every one of those is also a success. Can, canary analysis proves itself every time a canary fails. And now finally, what happens when canary analysis passes and then the system is fully deployed? Is that always a success, or are there surprises at that stage? Ha. Huh. Yeah, so um, we actually recently had a minor outage where a system w passed through canary analysis. Some of our most rigorous canary analysis process, to be, uh, actually, um, went into production at 100%, and then um, sometime later we found that there was a metric that we should have been looking at but didn't. And so we ended up having to do a complete rollback. Um, that can happen. You know, canary analysis is not a p panacea uh, for all of our woes. It's meant to be a useful thing that will give you an added increased confidence in your deployment and in the quality of the code that you're getting into production. But it's also an ongoing um, improving process, and it's also an ongoing uh, fine-tuning process. So at Netflix, we don't have anybody managing your Canary configuration for you. Uh, Netflix developers are responsible for writing code, testing it, deploying it into production, responding to alerts, but also configuring their own canary analysis uh, parameters. So for example, that team had to go back to the configuration of their canaries and say, oh, hey, you know, this metric is actually a little more important to us in terms of defining the, the success of the canary than we thought it was. So from now on, we'll include that in our calculations. Very good. Roy, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.